Greetings from the United Nations headquarters in New York. I'm Dan Thomas, Chief of Communications at the UN Global Compact. Today, the UN Global Compact Academy is pleased to host this special briefing on the Secretary General's uh, Climate Action Summit and the road ahead to COP25, taking place this year in Madrid. COPs are the annual climate change negotiations convened by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And the Academy is an online platform designed to provide participating companies of the Global Compact with the knowledge and skills they need to meet their sustainability objectives and achieve long-term growth by contributing to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Today's session is part of our Open Influencers series, where we bring together prominent leaders from the United Nations and business who together are shaping the sustainability agenda. Today, our panelists will reflect on the outcomes of the Climate Action Summit and look at next steps, highlighting ways that the private sector and non-state actors can best continue to contribute to shaping the global climate agenda. I'm delighted to be joined here today by the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Climate Action Hello. Summit, Ambassador Luis Alfonso de Alba. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And Lisa Kingo, the CEO and Executive Director of the United Nations Global Compact. On the line from uh, Madrid is Carlos Sale, uh, the Senior Vice President of Energy Policies and Climate Change at Iberdrola. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, live from Spain. Pleasure. We were hoping to be joined by Gonzalo Munoz, the high-level champion for COP25, but unfortunately he had to drop out at short notice. In just a minute, we'll hear about what happened at the Climate Action Summit in New York this past September and update you on further engagement opportunities. We'll also be answering your questions live, so please submit them anytime using the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. Thank you to those who already submitted questions. We've incorporated many of those into today's discussion. And so without further ado, I'd like to uh, 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 ask you, Ambassador, uh, tell us a bit about the Climate Action Summit in September. What were the main uh, political outcomes? Well, I think the, the, the most important outcome is the fact that uh, the Secretary General has been able to convene a high-level uh, representation from all sectors and, and all stakeholders, uh, first of all, to take stock of the gravity of this, is the, this situation and the urgency to act, but also to identify the, the, the solutions. I think raising awareness uh, was also very much helped by the youth movement, and uh, we mm -hmm. need to pay tribute to them, to the strikes on the streets on Friday, and the fact that uh, a number of non-state actors actively engage into the preparation. This was not an event a summit of one day. It is a process. It is a process of building partnerships, and I think <coughs> in that sense it was very su successful. Tell us a little bit more about the youth uh, energy that the, the young people brought. That was, uh, that was something that the media in particular really picked up on, didn't yes, they? Yes, well, I think it was very important, the, the, the manner in which they have uh, uh, raised awareness worldwide, in yeah. many activities developing in hundreds of countries, uh, was impressive, but uh, uh, we also provide a space within the United Nations for them, and we organized the first ever uh, youth summit in right. the premises of the, the UN. Uh, and it was extremely useful because they had the opportunity not only to send messages and, and, and a call, an urgent call for action to, to governments and other stakeholders, mm -hmm. but they were also able to commit themselves uh, to do things on a daily basis that will help fighting climate change. So it was a meeting on which they interact between themselves, they interact with the governmental representation, with non-governmental mm. representation. It was an intergenerational dialogue, uh, the, the one we, we witnessed. And their contributions were also showcased at the opening of the summit. They had a dialogue with the Secretary General. Mm. Greta Thunberg was uh, a very prominent figure in that uh, dialogue. And she sent very strong messages that we all Listen very carefully. Thank you. And Lisa Kinga, the private sector came uh, <coughs> came to the Climate Action Summit in a big way, didn't they? Uh, tell us about about that, how they came and, and what they brought to the Climate Action Summit. Um, the, the, the private sector, the business sector, um, was were very interested in the COP and came to the UN with many different things. 
uh, good examples, good cases that were presented mm -hmm. together with uh, other stakeholder alliances. And in particular, I feel a very strong call to action in joining uh, the 1.5 campaign, signing up to setting uh, science-based targets aligned with a 1.5 scenario uh, within the next uh, couple of years. I felt that was a very strong uh, commitment uh, by companies that are basically taking a leap into the unknown because it's a very uh, ambitious commitment that will take breakthrough innovation for any company to achieve. So we had a great celebration of the 87 companies that signed up uh, at the summit. Uh, today we have um, close to 120 companies that, ha that have signed. We have just uh, more than 20 new companies from Iberia that signed last week. And we are gathering more momentum towards the COP25 in Spain. So the whole idea um, is to set a new normal for what we hope uh, companies will aim for going forward in terms of becoming net zero by 2030. So it's, it's sending a very important signal that we are reaching a tipping point for what climate action looks like. And I, I, I meet many companies that are very aware that this is of course part of running a responsible business but it's also part to be an efficient business. Um, and the next couple of decades, uh, the climate transformation and the global goals as such is probably the biggest business opportunity for uh, businesses. So there's also a huge business interest in joining a 1.5 scenario and contributing to um, the energy transition. Uh, the new climate economy has estimated that there's a $26 trillion uh, upside uh, for the global GDP in pushing on with this energy transition and more than 65 million jobs across the world to be derived from this. So many companies have understood the combination of being responsible and of doing breakthrough innovation to really optimize their business model and their business perspectives. And it's not an easy commitment to make, is it? I mean, it's a particularly ambitious uh, commitment to publicly make. Uh, so so uh, w what does it mean for companies to make that commitment? Well, it is a big commitment. I mean, first of all, it's a tall challenge. It's a very tall challenge. Next, it has to be documented by the science-based targets methodology which requires significant data, significant analysis and target setting in the company. So it was very interesting to speak to many of the new companies that just mm -hmm. uh, joined in Spain and Portugal, because some of these companies are also small companies, mm. but they actually take the effort of setting up the science-based targets because they want to build their business on the new climate economy and they want to do this right from the start. So we see both very large multinational companies, but also smaller companies joining. And <coughs> in all the companies, I think it's a common denominator that employees are very proud right. that, you know, my company is joining the 1.5 campaign, Our Common Future. It's a very important part of mm -hmm. building, you know, the momentum and the engagement for a company. And it's clearly being noticed by the financial community, by the right. investment community as well, that are becoming more and more, how should I say, committed and engaged in the climate agenda as well. We see the TCFD becoming more and more mainstream. So, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, all stakeholders are convening towards an energy transition. And as the Secretary General likes to say, the climate train has left the station. Uh, this is rolling now. I mean, make sure to get on the train and don't end up on the bandwagon. Don't get left behind. Exactly. Ambassador to Alba, <laughs> um, what other examples uh, of private sector engagement did you see coming out of the Climate Action Summit? Well, let me, let me start by telling you that it was quite a different summit from previous one, because uh, <coughs> building partnerships uh, was a priority f 
for us. And uh, the participation of the business sector and other non-state actors uh, was e extraordinary. Uh, we were not looking at into a number of participants or a number of proposals to be presented, but to a selection of the best and building coalitions between governmental and non-governmental actors. We end up uh, having in a single setting 60 governmental participants and 30 non-governmental participants right. uh, joining, preparing initiatives uh, uh, also jointly. And uh, uh, in that sense, I think it was a, a an exercise that need to be continued uh, and, and has a follow-up. Uh, among the proposals, we identify roughly 20 of them. Uh, there are some which are very it's significant because they have a transformational impact and a scale mm -hmm. that is going to be important. Uh, we saw movement from the private sector, which is quite important, not only on energy transition and uh, renewables, but also on uh, sectors which are big emitters, uh, hard to abate sectors, mm. the cement industry, the shipping industry, just to mention a few examples. We saw movement on the uh, agribusiness, uh, which is very important. Nature-based solutions has taken a very important stage into the, the, the set of solutions uh, that, that, that we can uh, tackle uh, to deal with the question. Uh, there are many examples. I don't want to, to be exhaustive, <coughs> but uh, I want to invite uh, our viewers to do the follow-up of these initiatives because this <coughs> is also something which is unique of from this summit. The summit doesn't end on the 23rd of September. It will have a follow-up. The first stop is going to be in, in Madrid uh, at the time we meet uh, for the COP25. Right. And certainly from there, we will need uh, to, to, <coughs> to develop a plan until uh, COP26 which is a moment on which uh, uh, all member states and other actors uh, need to come with an uh, enhanced ambition. We yeah. need to raise the ambition urgently. We need to be in line, as Lisa was uh, mentioning, with the, with the scientific uh, uh, goal of 1.5. And I think that has also been an achievement of the summit. Everybody is already looking into that science-based target as the only one we can mm. follow. So in encouraging news, in other words, mm -hmm. that Very there is uh, momentum, the, the private sector is, uh, is stepping up. Um, <laughs> Carlos Sally, uh, you're on the line from Madrid. Thank you for joining us. Um, tell us about uh, the Climate Summit uh, from your point of view. Um, you stepped up as a company. Uh, tell us what you brought to New York uh, at the Climate Action Summit. Well, first of all, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to to, to share with people like uh, Luis Alfonso and Liz uh, that are references for, for fighting against climate change, these sort of uh, events. Uh, well, concerning uh, the business case that we have followed during the last 20 years that allow us to, to go as a leader company to, to New York, first, we have to say that we are analyzing mega trends. Uh, the first of it is that we trust in scientists. The consensus is uh, huge uh, uh, of the climate change problem. And um, from many years ago, we are, we, they are announcing, the scientists are announcing that we need to, uh, to act urgently and, and with ambition not to surpass the stability limits of the planet. Uh, the second is that we have eyes and we are seeing that the extreme events announced by the scientists are even worse than predicted with more frequency and I intensity. So, so at the end, we have exponential problems and we need exponential solutions. And this is the, 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 our, our main message that we are sending to, to, to everybody. The third issue is that all the other mega trends are pointing out in the same direction. We need the decarbonization of the economy. And as a summary of mega trends, a, a very brief summary of this mega trend that is analyzed by a, a, an investor like Iberdrola uh, is Near 200 countries are developing or reinforcing regulation to force decarbonization. Uh, a bigger uh, civil society awareness is making pressure to administration and corporation to align with 2030 agenda and mainly with uh, SEG number 13. Uh, also, a bigger uh, implication of subnational administration in environmental regulations that reduce the relative importance of global uh, or national policies that are slower to implement than the ones that are, for instance, made by, by local authorities. Another important megatrends is 
uh, all, all the policies that we have uh, with air quality problems that are not uh, climate change, but are the same sources producing the air quality than, than uh, producing climate change. And also the same solution are, are for that. And the, the very good uh, issue is that the huge contribution that we have in this moment in the reduction of the low carbon technology that we are uh, having in the last uh, decade uh, that put away the competitiveness of several technologies based on fossil fuels, both in production and consumption side. So that all these mega trends also produce another mega trend that is the pressure of capital market to those business models based on fossil fuels that introduce a high risk of a stranded assets if you invest in, in, in this sort of mega trends. Well, and with all these mega trends analyzed, we decided 20 years ago to follow the signals of the Kyoto Protocol we start to invest billions of uh, euros in, in wind energy. Uh, we invest a lot in innovation. We develop the first control room worldwide to operate, control, supervise, and monitor all of our uh, renewable uh, plants around the world. Also, we help others to innovate. For instance, the manufacturers of uh, Siemens Gamesa, uh, in the contract that we sign with them, we ask as a requirement for the technology to move uh, more flexible to the to the operations, so at the end we have our achieved very high penetration levels in the in the network. So uh, having no excuses for introducing a lot of renewables in our system. The other very nice example is shipyards. Uh, with the shipyard, we convince them to, uh, that with relatively small modification in their factories uh, designed to construct uh, chips, uh, they can uh, build some components of our offshore uh, plants like pylons or, or jackets. So at the end, uh, that allows to sign contract for offshore plants in the Baltic Sea and North Sea, and allows to, to explain them that the diversification of their products are a very important issue, not only constructing ships, uh, but going to other sort of uh, job uh, in, the, in the green economy. Uh, also, we close oil, uh, oil plants uh, and two years ago, we announced uh, the, the closure of our two last coal plants worldwide. So at the end, uh, well, we have a, a business model that also uh, preserves the just transition, uh, apart for, from following the International Labor Organization and being one of the first signatories of Global Compact. We have powerful internal code of ethics, uh, and also we reallocate all direct uh, workers that we close when, uh, when we close a plant. Uh, we help the, the responsible administration to look for solutions with indirect, indirect jobs, and we create thousands of sustainable jobs in new uh, zones with social problems. Uh, and with all this story, we, we went to, to New York, uh, and we have, 20, uh, we have passed in the last 20 years from being the 20th electric uh, utility in market capitalization to become currently one of the top five. So demonstrating that a business model oriented to the green economy is good for the planet, for the citizen, but also good for our shareholders. That's very, that's very encouraging. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a lot there that you, uh, you mentioned. But one of the things that Mr. Saleh mentioned was really the sort of the death of coal mm -hmm. as a, as a uh, you know, uh, in use. I mean, do, did you get a sense at the Climate Action Summit that that signal was going out into the world and that the private sector was, was picking that up? Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me start by recognizing that it was the Secretary General who made the very strong call in the middle of the year mm. uh, for the not uh, to build new coal plants uh, after 2020, to reduce the subsidies to fossil fuels, and, and to, ta to tax the uh, pollution and not, uh, not the people. Right. And this has got a very positive response. More than 30 countries came uh, for the summit already with plans to abandon coal, and we are going to continue to work on, on others. But they need a transition, they need alternatives. Right. And I think it is uh, quite important for the business community, as well as for the governments, mm. to start looking into the, the ways in which we can, we can help those transitions. And I'm thinking particularly on, in countries which have a high level of emissions because of coal plants, in Asia, in Africa particularly. Mm. And uh, uh, Mr. Saleh, you, you also mentioned the 1.5 uh, campaign which you, which you joined. Just tell us, how, how hard was it for a company like yours, yours to make that ambitious commitment? 
Well, I think I, I have to say that for us, all this the carbonization process revolution for like like it's the case for other companies, but it's a, an evolution, a normal evolution that we have had during the, the last 20 years. So uh, I recognize that, that this commitment that we have uh, uh, included in the pledge, when we signed the pledge, uh, uh, is a tough uh, uh, task for, for us, as a, it's a challenge, but, but we, we know that as all the commitment that we have present public, uh, public uh, we, we will solve it. Uh, we have to convince uh, not only all the our um, chain supply to to also to 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 move to this decarbonization, but also in in our processes we we keep on working in that that sense. That it's very important that we have to follow also and to help to the administration to 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 develop the the regulation that is needed for 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 reducing this footprint in all all our um, value chain. Why? Because for instance, we we could have a lot of intention to to decarbonize the, the, the our our business model, but in many uh, in some countries we can have the 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 problem that the administration don't allow us to 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 close to close some plant, for instance, uh, a fossil mm -hmm. plant. So uh, we have to convince also the administration that the regulation is uh, allows to to the decarbonization of the actor, you know, or for instance. Maybe in, in our value chain, we, we, we help all the suppliers to defend uh, in, the, in, the, in, their, in their administration, the regulators, to develop some regulation also to help them to, to make this, uh, this decarbonization. Because if not, at the end, you have the problem of allowing people uh, with a very different model that uh, allows them to, to maintain the, the uh, polluting activity that is against those that are first mover for, for this activity. So this is very important to, to fulfill also for the administration, the, the development of that. And uh, look, turning to one comment that I told you before that we need uh, exponential solution for exponential problems. Uh, when we went to, to, uh, to New York, to the then of, of the Secretary General, we claim that in many cases, the, the investors, the companies and, and the financial sector is ready to invest and to, to make this, uh, this uh, exponential uh, investment. But in many cases, we have some administrative problems uh, in the regulation, for instance. Uh, in this moment, uh, we can construct a photovoltaic plant of uh, 500 megawatts, that is enormous, uh, in, in less than one year, in 11 months, for instance. But the problem is, that the regulation, the administration in, in, in the laws are made for, for the case when nuclear plants or, or thermal plants that are very complicated uh, was, the, was the, the main case, the business case. Uh, and we, we, we have in many cases administrative problems uh, of having four to five years to solve all this process. Uh, and on the contrary, we are very fast in, 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 in investing. So we need to change a lot these rules because we need this exponential uh, investment. And in this moment, in some cases, we have not the, the ability to invest because of the administrative barriers that we have. Yeah. So uh, Ambassador de Alba, uh, the next 14 months are going to be critical, uh, you know, as we go through uh, COP25 and then we build towards uh, COP26 in, in Glasgow. That's setting a deadline for countries to, to present their revised, uh, more ambitious commitments. Um, what's, what's your role in driving more ambition uh, around climate action in the next 14 months? Well, let me, let me highlight that uh, the outcome of this summit was the result to a large extent of uh, uh, the work of coalitions, coalitions that were built on which member states together with uh, non-state actors and agencies of the UN system work together. Our intention is for those coalitions to continue mm -hmm. uh, with different shapes uh, and, and different pates, uh, depending mm -hmm. on the number of initiatives that they have identified, and to present periodic uh, reports on progress. Because we need to scale up. Uh, we are far from the, 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 the point we need. Uh, we need to scape al uh, escape, um, scale up the, the, the level of ambition. We need uh, new sectors to embrace uh, these uh, uh, goals. And we need uh, also to identify what are the 
uh, possibilities that we have to increase innovation, to increase finance. Uh, Carlos was very rightly say, say, say pointing the finger also on regulations mm -hmm. that need to be changed. Right. Uh, all asset owners uh, need to, mo to, to move. They have started, but we need uh, much more resources. So there is a full program, but uh, the point that I would like to highlight is the, 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 the fact that we need to do this in partnerships. Right. There is full recognition that no government alone would be able to deal with this mm -hmm. issue. No country alone would be able. Mm. And Lisa Kingo, um, what can the private sector uh, bring to the, the, the talks in the next 14 months? We've seen some, some good momentum, some ambition from <coughs> a number of companies. Uh, maybe not enough, but what, what does the future hold? Well, um, first of all, of course, we would like even more companies to join the climate movement and the 1.5 campaign. Mm. Um, but I think that what we are seeing at the moment is great engagement and great, uh, how should I say, innovation spirit from many companies and real willingness to engage in the coalitions mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. ambassador is referring to. Mm. So I, I, I think that what should happen going forward is that more ambition loops are created mm. at a national level where companies join governments in working out how they can inspire each other to make the energy transition a reality, mm. uh, country by country. Um, I think this sort of practical way of working together, inspiring each other, um, governments making sure that the right regulatory framework is there to drive the energy transition, mm -hmm. while companies uh, offer their innovative ideas, mm -hmm. uh, their progressivity to sort of um, up the ambitions at a national level. And I think that will be really exciting to see when we uh, will, will look at the next generation mm -hmm. climate plans. Mm -hmm. We need really close cooperation between businesses and governments mm -hmm. to be even more ambitious, ambitious and sort of drive um, a clear activities together going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Mr. Sally, um, Iberdrola has supported responsible climate uh, policy in Spain and, and in, in Europe as well. What advice would you like to share with companies looking uh, at supporting more ambitious climate policies? Well, the way that we are supporting uh, the, the responsible of policies uh, is that there are a lot of actors that are against to have an urgent and an ambitious process for the decarbonization. Those actors make a lot of pressure to the different administrations trying to stop or delay the process. And we offer those administrations to use our position uh, as an example to counteract uh, uh, other positions. Uh, the first thing is that we support, uh, mainly support for, uh, through our investment and from our business model oriented to the green economy. This is the main support that we are giving to them. The second is we help them supporting policies, good policies for, for, for the decarbonization not only presenting proposals uh, to the administration based on the polluter based principle uh, and just transition measures, uh, but also supporting the regulatory, fiscal and legal initiative that we need for, for that with our real, no theoretical, long-term uh, business case example. And the third way that we are supporting the administration is helping to change the narrative through the awareness of society. Uh, the implication of society is a very powerful uh, and it's a is as powerful than, than policy. So we, we need the, the citizens to be involved in the, in the, in the signal that we, we have to receive uh, from the uh, corporation and administration side. So uh, we have to change from saying that the problem will happen far away from me and in many years to, to, that, to, to the new narrative that we are already suffering very relevant problems close to me. And from saying that the decarbonization of the economy destroys jobs and stop economic growth to present that the cost of decarbonization is much lower than non-decarbonization. And how is this narrative? Well, first, we have to explain in a didactic way the externalities. Citizens are already paying a lot of hidden costs created by climate change and air pollution through the general taxes paid uh, to the public budget 
for instance, when extreme storms uh, or fires destroy our infrastructure, uh, those costs come from the budget or infrastructure ministry. Or when severe drought uh, produces severe problems to farmers, the subsidies come from the budget of the agriculture ministry. Or when we, uh, with the air pollution, send people to the hospital, the cost of the treatment comes from the budget of health uh, ministry. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have to create this narrative uh, explaining that the decarbonization is needed and we are already paying the cost of non-decarbonizing. But we also explain in the narrative uh, that real example of the green economy is plenty of opportunities, creating sustainable jobs, helping the economy to grow and supporting with a lot of different uh, products that we produce uh, for employees, kit for our employees, uh, uh, schools, um, producing documentaries, podcasts, uh, helping administration to make this narrative and the, the awareness that is needed for, for, for that. And concerning uh, the, the advice that you have, me, you have asked me for, for advice, this is very difficult, but, but from the humility, let me share with you some ideas. The idea is that we are in a multiple disruptive moment. Environmental disruption, climate change, uh, loss of uh, biodiversity, air quality with exponential problem arising. The second is we have a social disruption with a lot of problem arising all around the world with the 2030 agenda giving us the compass to solve the problems on the planet. And the third issue is the technological disruption. These are very good news because just uh, 10 years uh, ago, solving all the problems that we have in the planet was very costly. But in this moment, it's an opportunity because it's the most competitive uh, products or technology, uh, the, the low carbon technology is, is giving us. So in this, this reductive moment, we analyze a multiple mega trend. We have a lot of risk, not only physical risk of the climate change, but also uh, the, the transition risk because of new uh, fulfillment of normative that we have to, to, to develop or pressure of capital market or something like that. But we see a lot of opportunities. And I love, for to finish, I love the phrase of Seneca. Seneca uh, make a very nice statement that say that who don't know where to go will arrive to other place. <laughs> that we can rephrase that saying that there is no foul of the wind if you don't know where are you going to. So those that have not anticipated the disruption in the past have disappeared. For instance, those that didn't anticipate the development of digital photography or digital platforms have disappeared. And those that are not anticipating the need of the carbonization of the economy will disappear sooner than later. Well, that's a very good point. And thank you for introducing some... Uh, some uh, 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 Seneca as well to our discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa Kinga, here's a question that's come in live while mm -hmm. we've, been, uh, mm -hmm. we've been on air. Um, uh, a, a question about how the, uh, the UN Global Compact Local Networks uh, will be involved in the 1.5 campaign go going forwards. Are they encouraging members to join? Well, they absolutely are. And I'm just coming back from Lisbon, Portugal where the local network there in Spain and Portugal had organized a big event mm. to promote the 1.5 campaign. Uh, 23 companies were on stage uh, signing in public. Uh, it, it was uh, great to see a variety of large and small mm. companies. Mm. And this is happening across the world mm. in global compacts close to 70 local networks. Right. So um, now we are concentrating very much to have more companies join the campaign up to the COP in Spain, COP25. Going forward towards COP26, we are launching what we call the Global Impact Initiative at Compact that focus on assisting companies and inspiring companies to set more ambitious targets on the SDGs in general, on gender, and of course on climate 1.5. So the whole next year is also going to be about all our local networks, liaising with companies on the ground, supporting mm -hmm. companies to be able to sign up to the 1.5 mm -hmm. campaign. So we hope that this is a snowball that has started now and will grow bigger and bigger going forward and again create a real tipping point and a new normal for what is expected by business and definitely what mm -hmm. 
the UN is, recommenda is recommending, not least based on the IPCC report. Thank you. And uh, for you, uh, Ambassador, the, the final word, I think. Um, you know, you've, you've delivered an extraordinary uh, momentum at the Secretary General's Climate Action Summit. Mm -hmm. We're on our way to Madrid very soon for uh, COP25 and then looking ahead to COP26 in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, how are you feeling about this race? You know, is it a race we can win? How confident are you that the, the winds of change are now uh, moving in the right direction? <coughs> well, I, I, I think we had a very good start, but mm. certainly we are not yet there. And uh, in the next coming months, it's going to be critical to keep the momentum, to continue to build the partnership uh, I was mentioning. But we also need to be very clear. Uh, major emitters, whether governmental or non-governmental, are not on board yet. Mm. Not to the extent they need. So the strategy of the Secretary General will concentrate on the G20 members and some of the very difficult sectors that still need to do uh, much more. The not difficult sector, the sectors that have higher emissions. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do that. Uh, for the time being, we have seen movement and we have seen uh, the smaller countries to take the leadership, mm -hmm. uh, even though they are the less responsible of, uh, of the problem. Now we need the medium and, and big emitters to come up. I think it is going to be very, very important also that we understand that adaptation is, is also quite important, not only reducing emissions. Uh, at the summit, we were able to make a, a significant step. There are resources which are going to be mobilized, but that would be also a priority for us in the coming months. Remember that by the end of next year, uh, member states need to come to the COP26 with enhanced national determined contribution. Mm. And we are aiming at the decarbonization before the middle of the century. That means a reduction of emissions of almost half of the actual emissions before 2030. To achieve that, we have only 10 years, mm. 11 years. Yeah. So the sense of urgency it needs to be very much at the center of our work. Well, thank you, Ambassador de Alba, for your, your leadership. Lisa Kingo uh, from the UN Global Compact. Uh, Mr. Carlos Saleh from Iberdrola. Thank you all for your, your leadership and insights. We've heard many great examples of how leaders in the private sector are supporting climate action. We've seen the business case in ensuring their companies are, are fit for the future. And what we need now is more examples of how this leadership translates to concrete sector strategies with clear government policies that support these actions. We encourage all of you listening in today to join us at COP25 in just a few weeks' time. Our team is preparing various business events and stay tuned for more information on our website in the coming days and weeks, we'll also share with you a business guide for COP25. Together, we can make the next COP one of the most impactful yet, getting the world back on track when it comes to climate change. We look forward to meeting many of you in Madrid, as well as in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.